Well, I'm Steve Poppy. I'm the uh, horticulture scientist here at the West Central Research and Harvest Center, and welcome to our evening program. Looks like a, we changed the time a little bit to bring in other people from uh, within the region, so it looks like it's successful. We've got a lot of people here. Um, just one thing, if you hadn't grabbed the flyer from next month's program uh, for Comes Oral Fest, it's going to be about top performing perennials. And Mike here uh, is a unbelievable speaker on perennials. If you, he'd probably be the top number one uh, perennial speaker in, in, in the state of Minnesota. So if you're interested in perennials, he would be the speaker to see. So that's uh, next month on Wednesday, April 19th at 6 o'clock. So uh, if you're interested in that. But tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, vegetables and uh, some of the subject areas that I'm going to uh, talk about or touch base on is uh, it's very important to have a healthy, vigorous root system in any type of plant, okay? And we're going to uh, talk about that quite a bit and how you can, uh, you know, prepare your garden for a healthy, vigorous root system in your vegetables. Uh, maximize your space with succession planting. That'll be one subject area I'm going to touch base on. Uh, growing fall crops. Uh, another area that's a completely different way of growing some of these vegetables in the fall and having success with it. And then we'll talk about tomatoes, onions, carrots, peas, and melons. We'll touch base on those specific uh, vegetable crops. And if you have a question, anytime during my talk, just raise your hand and speak up. Or if you have a vegetable tip that you've had experience with that you can share with the group that might help us be better vegetable growers, please share. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, kind of practice this with a lot of my talks. We talk about healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy people. And uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about soils and how that can you know, help you uh, grow a better vegetable crop. But uh, the main emphasis here is if you follow some good cultural practices that support the development of a vigorous root system, result in efficient use of available nutrients. And I'm going to harp on that quite a bit during my talk. I'm going to mention about two or three times. But if you can remember that or highlight that, that's very important. And some of those things we're going to talk about are soil testing. I'm going to share with you how you can take a soil test so you can send it in and whatnot. Crop rotation is important uh, for disease prevention and insects and whatever else. Many of you probably know that. Just don't grow your tomatoes and potatoes and peppers and eggplants in the same area for more than three years at a time. You need to rotate them. And that's not always easy in a small vegetable area, but we'll talk about that. Growing cover crops, there's a lot more work, and we're doing some research recently on how to grow these cover crops. A lot of the now ag producers are starting to grow these cover crops. They're planting them in the, uh, in the fall, they're letting them overwinter, and then they're incorporating their corn and beans into some of these crops. But with some of these cover crops, we've got some real interesting research going on inside to touch base on this in a high tunnel. And a high tunnel is a plastic enclosure that's about 12 foot high, 28 foot wide, and we're growing peppers in there. And what we've done in the first year, we were not successful. The second year, we were. We overwintered a cover crop. And that cover crop is uh, things like rye and peas and vetch and those types of, of, types of greens that we planted in September in this high tunnel. And if any of you are experienced with a high tunnel, you know in a high tunnel, you're not getting any insulation from the snow. It's not falling in there. There's no extra moisture. Um, the temperature can fluctuate a lot during the winter in a high tunnel. But we've been successful, and we've planted these cover crops and overwintered them. And then we let them grow so tall in that high tunnel, and then we knocked them down in March or early April. And then we incorporate those into them and act as a green plant food, and then we plant the peppers in there. And in that 28 by 40 foot tunnel, we had close to 1,600 pounds of peppers that we harvested out there, not using any synthetic fertilizers, just using this, this uh, green manure. And the problem with a lot of people in high tunnels or anywhere, you start adding the manures, and you don't have uh, beneficial rainfall or snowfall in there. Your phosphorus levels are going to go right off the chart, and your salinity or your salt levels in that soil is also going to increase, which is detrimental to uh, plant growth and vegetables. So that's some of the research we're doing. <coughs> Composting, manure, I'll talk about that, and then applying some supplemental fertilizer. <coughs> well, what are the garden problems that are caused by poor soil quality? Um, 
some of the symptoms that maybe some of you are experiencing with poor soil quality are similar to what I've mentioned here in these bullets. And maybe your soil is dried and cracked and uh, in the summer, uh, that's a sign that you know there's, there's some poor soil quality. We're very fortunate in this area, we have great mineral soils in our area, and we don't have a lot of these issues, but some people do and some people don't. But we're very fortunate in, in having very rich soils in our area. If you're digging holes in the soil, it's difficult, whether it's wet or dry, to just you know open up and, and spade some soil. Uh, plants will even wither in hot weather, even if added extra water. That's a sign you might have some poor, poor uh, quality soil. And with uh, tomatoes and peppers, if you're familiar with blossom end rot, um, which actually is a calcium imbalance, but yet it's related to a poor developed root system. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the tomatoes and how to get a better root system. And also if you have poor soil or soil quality, the water tends to pool on the soil surface and it drains slowly, okay? Or else it runs off, you know, when you get a hard rainfall, it doesn't soak in. Well, garden soil. Um, talk about how we can create better garden soil by the use of organic matter. And that's a pretty broad term. It means a lot of things, but uh, we'll try to work our way through that and explain that better. Um, but organic matter keeps your soil loose and healthy. A lot of times when we apply some organic matter or at, at, at home or whatever else, you apply some of these uh, manures and whatnot, when you come to put in your crop the next year, it's just like actually slicing through butter. That, that soil is so mellow and uh, so rich and uh, that you've added some organic matter. Well, garden soil, you want to improve the ability of the soil to accept and store water. We talked about that. You want the water to go down where it's supposed to if you've got good organic matter. Um, more water goes into the soil, that's important, and less water runs off in the surface and then all these environmental concerns about, you know, wherever you might be, you know, on your lawn or in your garden, we don't want them moving into nearby rivers and lakes. And you can amend your soil, it may reduce the amount of water a garden requires. You just might not have to use as much water. And we'll talk a little later here in my slide presentation about uh, drip irrigation. We'll go into a little bit of detail about that and how you might water your, your garden more efficiently with a drip system. Well, what are some common organic amendments that you can all of us that do garden, we have some leaves, and leaves are probably the best and readily available source of organic matter, okay? They're very rich in, in a lot of nutrients for vegetable gardens. So if you have leaves, they're an easy way to incorporate a, a natural type of fertilizer into your garden. Um, cover crops, we'll go in a little bit more depth on that, how to grow cover crops. Uh, that's an easy way to add, add organic matter to your soil. And as I talked about both, you know, we're growing, in the winter, we're growing cover crops in a high tunnel. You can grow those in the winter in your garden too, outdoors, but both winter and summer crops can be used. And you can dig this cover crop in before uh, planting your garden. Uh, you can grow it in between the rows, uh, you know, and then uh, move your rows into that uh, uh, um, cover crop later in the season. But the thing with, um, you know, everybody thinks they should have a little bit of manure in their garden. It is, it, it is important. But uh, manures and manure compost tend to have high nitrogen. And nitrogen is if you're buying fertilizer, if you have 20, 20, 20, that first number, that first number 20 uh, represents the nitrogen or the N in your uh, fertilizer, in a synthetic fertilizer bag. But what uh, compost tend to have is too much ammonia, the nitrogen, or salt content. I talked about salt content. And when your soil has a high salt content, you can create some problems with your plants. And usually, it's a high pH, above eight. And uh, that's really high. Our soils around here, our heavy soils tend to be probably between 7.2 and 7.6. And 7.6 is probably getting too high, you're gonna create some problems. So we don't wanna bring up that pH. Well, what it is, it's general just to avoid using high rates, and I, I bolded that, of manure and manure compost. Uh, use manures in small amounts to replace the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. One little trick that I was shared at a conference many years ago. If you're using a compost, and you want to know, oh, how much should I put on? If you've ever eaten mashed potatoes before, and you've sprinkled pepper on your mashed potatoes, you kind of know what's the right amount. You don't want too much pepper on your potatoes. 
So visualize you sprinkling your pepper on your potatoes. That's how much manure you want in your garden. You still want to be able to see the soil. You don't want to completely <coughs> cover it in a solid mass of manure, or you might run into some of these problems that I mentioned here. When soil is ready, okay, soil should never be worked when it's too wet, okay? You just create more problems. Just be patient, don't work the ground too early. Um, there's a, the main reason for that is it lies in, there's some precious airspace in that soil. And when it's wet, you know, your footprints, your hands, or digging will just squish out all that airspace, and there's no room for the roots to spread and grow. And you really won't know this, that you're doing that, but then again, as I pointed out, it's important to you know, create this great soil for healthy crops. And one of the problems is working this when it is too wet. In compacted soils, they just tend to uh, drain more slowly, one of the problems I mentioned earlier. So the soil is very fragile. And we don't know all we need to know about soil, but if, if you can treat it right, you'll be rewarded with healthy crops. And again, pointing this out again, Cultural practices that support the development of a healthy, vigorous root system result in efficient use of the available nutrients. So how can we incorporate this organic matter into our soil? Well, the most common methods is digging or rototilling. But the problem with it, and I've mentioned this before in past talks, the excessive rototilling has a detrimental effect on our soil structure, particularly, again, when the soil is wet. Many, many years ago, uh, soil scientist here, Dr. Sam Evans, you know, with the agro agronomic crops that he grew and he trialed for many years, he was always talking about compaction and excessive rototilling on soil. It destroys the soil structure. It's just, if you do it again and again, it's going to be hard on that soil. So what you want to do is disturb that soil as little as possible, and there's this beneficial fungus in there, and also this natural soil structure to keep that intact and uh, you'll destroy that if you keep rototilling uh, time and time again. Um, again, some of the effects of rototilling can uh, compact the soil just below the, the, the tillage depth, and again, reduce that volume of pore spaces in the soil, and actually it can kill some of those beneficial earthworms too with that compaction. Well, we all know digging our garden is very hard work, as I put in bold right there but it will enable you to incorporate all this organic matter deeply, or as deep as you want uh, when, you, when you dig this material in. Yeah? What's overtilling? Overtilling? Doing it once a year in the spring? I, I would say, you know, from my perspective, if you do it once a year, that would be okay, but a lot of people will run those tillers up and down in between their rows to weed every time. Yeah, yeah. mm-hmm. Don't want to do that. Mm -mm. Yeah, you want to avoid that. Again, I, uh, this, is, this is science that's been talked about for years and years, this compaction issue. And uh, with all of us in, in, our, in our small and large gardens, most of us do have a rototiller, but just don't use it excessively. And once you get, I'm talking about incorporating this organic matter into these soils, I talked about the soil feels like butter. It'll be easier for you, even when you get older, to still, uh, you know, a fork or spade this uh, uh, soil under. Talk about soil tests, okay? Really important. Uh, and the most important thing is you're never good to add amendments without knowing what the soil lacks, okay? Just if you've heard or read or whatever, you know, okay, I think I should add this or that or whatever. You need a soil test to tell you if that should be incorporated into your soil. And the University of Minnesota has a soil testing lab. I'll share with you a website uh, that you can go to to um, have your soil tested. But the quality of your soil, or well, the quality of your test results depends largely on the quality of your sample, too. And what I recommend is, depending on the size of your garden or whatever, um, you probably would take about uh, 15 or 16 soil corings and put them into an ice cream pail, a clean ice cream pail, and that would be about what you would need for a sample. Um, if your garden is large and you have different areas that have um, difference in fertility or whatever, you might want to take two different soil samples from other parts of your, your garden. Um, just an illustration, um, this is made for soil samples, but you can certainly use a trowel like this. Um, what you want to do when you take your soil samples is just scrape away or discard any surface or mat of grass or litter when you're taking these samples. 
Um, again, place the soil in a clean bucket. Make sure it doesn't have any other contaminants in it that will disrupt your soil sample when you send it in the lab. And repeat the sampling in several random locations, just probably doing an X or a W, walking across your garden or whatever else and taking it in several different areas. And then mix that all well. And uh, if you check out this website right here, it gives you a complete information that's on your, your handout there. And for about $17, you can have a complete soils test. And then, they will, and then when you do send that in, make sure you ask for interpretations. So they send you back what the recommended uh, fertility or whatever you might need. Yeah. How often should you do that? Well, I would say about once every three years should be adequate, something like that, um, to take a soil step. You don't have to do it every year. Okay. Do you send a whole ice cream bucket full? Or no, you, no. No. Normally, they will. Uh, if you uh, there are sample bags that uh, I'm not sure if the soils lab will, will send that. There, it, there are instructions on you what you need to know, but it's just a, a, about a pint sample of soil. But you want to take about that much and stir it around so it's all mixed up and uh, but uh, just a small sample. Crop rotations we mentioned that a little bit before. Uh, crop rotation is just deciding which crop to plant where from one year to the next. Uh, rotation will help manage your soil fertility, help avoid or reduce problems with soil borne insects and diseases. And um, I talked about that before. A lot of, all of us grow tomatoes, but the tomatoes, the peppers, the potatoes, and the eggplant are all in the same family, the Solanacea family. And if you plant those year after year in the same spot, you tend to get some uh, uh, problems with diseases or insects, so avoid that. Um, you should try if you can, depending on the size of your garden, rotate those about every three years. Um, but each crop has different nutrient requirements that affect your soil balance differently. <coughs> so, for example, up here, if you grow sweet corn in the same spot year after year, that area will run low on nitrogen and phosphorus. They are heavy feeders of nitrogen and phosphorus. And um, the solution is to, of course, simple. Just change the location of your sweet corn every year. And you'll be able to renew that pot so you can grow some of the other, other crops in that area. Now we'll just go into a little bit more depth on some of this so you can do these crop rotations properly by looking at some of the leafy pruning crops use up nitrogen quickly, okay, such as lettuce, cabbage, and tomatoes. They like nitrogen, okay? And the root feeders, root vegetables, the carrots, the potatoes, or whatever, are, are late feeders. And then these crops, the peas, the beans, and other legumes, what they do is add nitrogen to the soil that need lots of phosphorus, okay? So if you can kind of look at that first column there, over to my left, and think about that as we look at this uh, second column. So if you want to maintain a balance of soil nutrients by not planting the same category of crop, which is leafy, fruity, root, and legumes successfully in the same place. And it's best to follow nitrogen-fixing legumes, which are these right here, such as peas or beans, with nitrogen-loving leaf or fruity crops, such as lettuce or tomato. And I'll go into a little bit more depth how that whole process works with adding nitrogen to the soil with those types of crops. So just kind of look at this a couple times. You might have to read it a couple times and figure it out, but it makes a whole lot of sense how you're adding beneficial soil nutrients to the soil to grow one crop or the other. And then follow the heavy feeding crops with light feeding root crops. Just makes a whole lot of sense if you follow that balance. Growing cover crops. Cover crops are sown thickly at any time of year to form a living mulch. What they'll do is they'll keep your weeds in check and uh, what you want to do after you've grown it before it uh, uh, self seeds itself and becomes weeds themselves, you mow it down, and then turn this into the soil to provide organic matter and, and nutrients. And uh, this can include some of these crops, these vetch, clover, beans, the whole line of plants right there that can be grown as a very healthy uh, cover crop. You can either plant them in the early season, turn it under, and plant your warm season vegetables. So as soon as you can work the ground and say late April, early May, you could grow that cover crop probably for about 30 days because such plants as tomatoes and peppers and whatever, you don't probably want to plant out until all the danger of frost is, is passed in the late May or first of June. And you can plant those types of crops into that uh, uh, cover crop that you've worked in the ground. 
or after your early maturing vegetables, you know, your, your radishes, your cold crops and whatnot, after they're harvested, then you can plant a cover crop. And then just turn that dead plant material into the ground after killing frost in the late, in the late fall. Or another method to that is you can plant some of these things in between your rows too. And as I talked about avoiding running the tiller up and down through your rows, you can have some of these crops. Just again, make sure they, you mow them off before they self-seed themselves. But they, and then, growing in between your rows during that growing season, then you can switch your whatever row crop and plant it back into that cover crop the next year or else yet that fall. Again, I'm not trying to, um, uh, more and more of our work out here is moving towards the organic end, not using synthetic fertilizer. So a lot of what I'm sharing are ways to add your own fertilizer with natural crops and not adding synthetic fertilizer. Is um, like grass clippings a good, say, as leaves or anything? The question is, are grass clippings as good as leaves or whatever? No, they are extremely poor, okay? Grass clippings have this high carbon to nitrogen ratio and it needs to eat up nitrogen in order to break down. So if you add grass clippings or wood chips to your soil, that's a no-no, okay? Because it's just gonna rob all that nitrogen out of your soil. So uh, grass clippings are great for a mulch, but don't work them into the soil. Nitrogen so takes- remove the black grass clippings? Pardon? If you use them for mulch and remove it rather Yeah, I wouldn't work them in. They're still gonna rob that upper soil surface of some of that nitrogen that you're there, but it's not as bad as incorporating it, okay? Um, okay, we talked a little bit about these nitrogen fixing crops. Very unique process here, probably many of you have heard about it, but many plants in the legume family, I've talked about it before, the peas, the beans, the vetch, and the clovers, they grow in cooperation with soil-dwelling bacteria. And what that does is that bacteria lives in the nodules that are on the roots of these legumes. Okay, and then they fix nitrogen. The term fix, they take nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, from the air and convert it to a form that plants can use. It's a unique process. Uh, soybeans do it. Um, and when the legume dies and its roots begin to decompose, the nitrogen in the nodules become available to other plants when plants are killed under. So you can grow these types of crops, and as we back up those other slides before, some of those crops that need lots of nitrogen, such as sweet corn and whatever else, you can grow those types of plants in those types of plants that are in the legume family. I have a question. Sure. If you sell, um, grow soybeans in your garden, do you want to It has to be in court. The, the question was growing soybeans in your in your garden. And you need to work it into the soil for that process to take place. Okay. The whole plant. The whole plant, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yep. And then you've got the. You know, pardon? We grow edible ones. Edible soybeans. Okay. I thought about you know leaving the plants and letting them just freeze. Yep, and that'd be fine too. Let them freeze okay. and work them in the ground, right? Okay. And you'll have that beneficial nitrogen there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah, we are, with this high tunnel project, I mean, we were, with these types of crops, growing in a high tunnel, which is a whole different environment, mm -hmm. we were able to add 100, there were three different treatments. It was anywhere from 125 to 137 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre, just growing those in there. And peppers require about 100 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. We exceeded that just growing those and growing our peppers in there, so, yeah without adding any synthetic fertilizer. Yes? How about <clears throat> regular green beans? Do they get like a leaf blight on them or something before you work? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the question is if you do have some leaf disease on there, that's probably not very, very beneficial. Most times uh, that leaf disease is not gonna pose a problem, you know, but uh, I'd be a little hesitant on that if it had leaf disease and incorporating them back into your soil. Most times, you know, and we've talked about strawberries with leaf spot or, you know, and leaf scorch. You can work those into the ground and they're not a problem, but uh, I'm not going to say yes or no. Yeah. So do you let them, like, you're saying at the end of the beans and you're going to pick them, leave them dry out, or do you want to till them, like, work them 
you can just let them dry out either way. You can incorporate them green as a green manure crop or just let them dry out either way. Okay, let's talk about an efficient way to water your vegetable plants is with a drip irrigation system. There are kits that you can uh, purchase. Are any of you using drip irrigation in your vegetable crops? There's a couple, that's good, okay. Um, well, this is just a, a, a slight drawing of what, what it might look like or how it might work with a valve. You've got a black flow preventer that prevents any, if you do fertilize or fertigate, so the fertilizer doesn't go back into your water table. Um, you've got a pressure regulator that's set. It, this, this type of water system uses, oh, probably less than about 10 or 20 PSI to operate. It doesn't need a full flow of water, and that pressure regulator is normally set to just have the perfect flow to operate this drip system here. You need a filter. Uh, you need to filter out, you know, if there are any minerals or whatever in your water so it doesn't plug up this emitter right here. And then there's an adapter here, and then you've got a tube, or uh, some of them are flat tape too. This, uh, we use both. But uh, uh, a very efficient system, uh, and some of the advantages of that are um, it might require half the amount of water that you might need uh, for sprinkler irrigation. Um, when you're using just a, a basic rain bird or a, a wave type sprinkler, and you probably know that a lot of that does evaporate and you lose a lot of that. Here with the drip line irrigation, you're putting down the water where the roots are, where it's being most efficient. Disease pressures may be less because you're not wetting the plant foliage, okay? Uh, if you, just to uh, change gears here, if you do use any type of sprinkler system on any type of crop, vegetables or fruits or whatever, you wanna make sure you don't water after four o'clock, okay? You want the foliage to dry down. And uh, so chance the foliage has enough time yet in the late afternoon and early evening to dry down to have less apt problem with any of these diseases. You can also, with this system, uh, you can automate it. You can tell it what to do, to come on at 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever else, and uh, you can have a timer on it, which is, makes very efficient use of the water. Again, the applications are made directly to the root zone. Uh, no application of water is in between the rows, so you can um, have excellent weed control. You're not watering the weeds in between the rows, you're just watering the plants or the plant roots. Um, you can even harvest when you're uh, doing any type of drip irrigation because the areas in between the rows remain dry. And also you can, I talked about, uh, you can fertigate, you can inject a fertilizer into these drip tube systems to water right in the row. Again, you're not fertigating or you're not fertilizing the weeds in between the row. And, uh, and also compared to sprinkler irrigation, there's no soil erosion. Disadvantages, of course, and there are some limitations. Uh, the initial, initial investment costs are higher for purchasing this type of system. Um, you can have rodent, insect, and human damage. Um, as right here with this right here, you can certainly nick that with a hole or, or a trowel or whatever else when you're trying to weed in the rows. But, um, um, and again, mice like plastic. Um, we had a system in uh, a day neutral strawberry plot that Verdi well recalls that it was a dry year and that drip tube had water in it. Well, a skunk found it and he just tore it up and we had to make numerous, numerous patches to repair that because he had torn into that. Um, you need good water filtration or else you're going to plug up those small emitter holes. So you got to have a good filter. And, uh, compared to sprinkler irrigation, water distribution in the soil is restricted. So you can only, if you're, and what that means is, depending on the, your crop and how wide the roots are and what type of soil you have, if you have that one row of drip tube going down the row, it's only gonna water probably about 12 inches or six inches on either side of the row. So it might restrict, and you might not be getting water to the outside of some of those roots of certain uh, vegetables. Okay, now we're gonna talk about succession planning and what that means. Well, it's a way to extend your harvest by staggering plantings of crops or planting varieties with staggered maturing dates. A good succession plant, as I explained this more, you need to have fresh fruit from spring until fall. 
And before planning, and I'll explain this more, you want to create a detailed succession plan of what and when to plan, and develop an understanding of their individual growth habits and preferences. And I'll explain that more as we move through this. So here's an illustration of somebody that has these boxes on their patio of their growing these leafy greens, where these were started earlier, and these were probably started a couple weeks later, and these are the, the newest seed. So what you want to do is you want to sow small amounts of seed at regular intervals. And for instance, sowing these small rows of leafy greens on a, probably a weekly or every two-week basis, it uh, ensures you have a consistent supply of salads rather than a big surplus all at one time. And that's normally the problem. You plant a full 20, 40 foot row of lettuce and it's all there at one time. What do you do with it? So if you use succession planting, you're just, up, you're just planting just the right amount so you have fresh greens you know, as long as you want. You can also planting at the same time with different varieties that mature at different times, such as corn. If you look at corn, and again, you need to find a lot of these instructions are on the seed packet. They will tell you what to do, you know, with their, how long they're going to take before they mature and whatnot. But, you know, some early, some middle, and some late ripening corn, you can get 65 or 70 day corn, you can get about 80, and you can get 90 day sweet corn. So, just a way you can plant them all at the same time with, with this corn, but then you just don't have to harvest everything at the same time. Uh, catalog descriptions and seed packet instructions, again, I mentioned those a little bit, are very important to find out the statistics on each one of these vegetables that you might grow with this system. Uh, it tells you when to first plant in the spring, how many days the variety takes before it reaches maturity, and how much space it requires, and if it's frost tolerant. You need to know all those things before you use this type of system. And this just showing some uh, broccoli, you know, some uh, ones that were planted later. Probably will be in the harvest soon, and then planting another variety a little later. Avoid diseases and pests depending on what family a vegetable belongs to. Again, with any type of system, not just succession planting, but avoid planting one member, say tomatoes, in the same spot where cousins, and I mentioned this before, peppers, eggplants, potatoes grew for the previous three years. And avoid planting in the same spot the brassica vegetables, such as the kale, the cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, turnips, cabbage, and whatnot. So try and avoid, if you're using these types of structures to, to grow, such as these boxes, you want to avoid some of these so you don't get any problems with diseases or insects later on. Okay, now we'll jump ahead to uh, fall crops. Um, this is a very good time to plant some of these, the spinach, the broccoli, the carrot, the cabbage, leaf lettuce, and radishes. Um, and these are not commonly grow in, in the greenhouses in our area. Um, colorful season sells, you know, they do start them and whatnot. He says maybe they sell about 100 plants. Because it's just unusual for people. They're either exhausted about midsummer of doing all this work in their vegetable garden, they're sick and tired of weeding and whatnot. But it's a very great time to grow some of these uh, crops, such as what I just mentioned there for a fall crop. Um, so what you need to first do is remove all the leftover debris that's from your spring planting, clean it up. And before sowing these second crops, you need to turn the soil under, mix in some supplemental fertilizer that the earlier plants used up. And now you're in warm weather. You're probably in probably mid-July or so, maybe uh, late July for some of these uh, growing of fall crops. Um, the seeds are gonna germinate very quickly, much faster than they do in the spring when you're planting in, in April and May. And they will mature as the temperature starts to cool. And then these plants will not struggle like they did in the summer. Um, it's starting to cool down a little bit and uh, makes for a much better crop. Um, you're likely to see insect damage growing these as fall crops. The insects are not as prevalent during the fall season. Uh, there's less heat, there's less humidity, and there's fewer fungal diseases that will affect your plants. A real plus in growing these as a, as a fall crop. And a lot of these cool season vegetables you don't need transplants. You don't need to buy them from a greenhouse. You can just mostly, most of them will direct seed themselves. And from my research that I've, that I've looked at, most of these uh, cool season vegetables actually taste better after a touch of frost. And it's said that exposure to light frost concentrates the sugars in fall vegetables. So they have a little better flavor, a little bit sweeter flavor. 
Well, if you want to grow vegetables for that midsummer planting, again, look at the packet. You need to know the and, and you need to know your average first frost date, which probably around here is close to October 1st end of September. So broccoli, 50 to 70 degrees, 50 to 70 days to maturity, and they will survive a light frost. Um, Brussels sprouts, takes a little longer. They need about a 90 to 100 days uh, back from say October 1, but they will survive down to 20 degrees if you enjoy Brussels sprouts. That's uh, way into October. Carrots, 70 to 80 days, um, so those be two to three months before chilling frost. I've done that personally myself. We grow all our carrots now at our house. We I don't see them till probably in the, you know early July or so, and they're all just the right perfect size when we harvest them. Actually, carrots if you start them in the early season and it gets into September and they get very large, they've almost lost all their nutrition when they get to a point where they're very large. When they're at a certain size, a smaller size, they're more highly nutritious. The carrots are than they are when they're bigger and they get old. And we thought we're still eating carrots to this day from that fall crop of uh, carrots. We still have them in our refrigerator and we're, we're still eating them, so they're just great. Um, and carrots are known to taste better when, they're, when they grow through a few frosts too. Cabbage, if you're interested in those, again, cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, carrots are all direct seeded. You don't need to buy the plant. Cabbage can take down to 20 degrees. Peas can survive in the high 20s. Radishes, 30 to 60 days, dig until the soil freezes. I wish I could show you a picture of uh, my wife and I, we grow champion radish, and we grow them all season long. But uh, my, the picture I had, I wasn't able to download it because my other phone, I had it on my camera phone, and that froze up. But she had two radishes in her hand. They were like uh, apples, you know, and they were radish. They were grown in the fall, and they were not quite the size of a small apple, and they were crunchy, they were not woody, and we were still harvesting in October. So uh, a great way to grow radishes in the fall. Spinach is another great crop, very short season, 30 to 45 days. I know with spinach, when we grow in the spring, it always just grows so well there fast, you can't keep up with it. Here it just slows down a little bit. Quick question. Sure. Um, when you do I think you could still, I mean, you'll still be able to do some tillage for your spring planting or whatever else. You're just, your plants might still be there, um, but by that time, probably, hopefully, you'll be removing most of those, you know. Um, if you can get in that tillage before a hard freeze, that would be great, but uh, yeah, the timing on that might be a little bit critical if you want to work your ground, but. Uh, do you think it's important to till the ground? Do I think it's important to till the ground? I think it is important to till the ground in the fall before you know, before a hard freeze. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, we went from fall, now we're going back to summer. We mentioned some of these specific crops. Um, garden peas, okay, growing these as a, as a summer crop. Uh, the season for, for growing peas is very short, so sow in the ground as early as you can. Um, treat the pea seed carefully. If you find one that's cracked, it is unlikely that that one's gonna germinate. Because it seems like you always find a few cracked pea seeds in your packet. Requires about 60 days of growth before harvest. And uh, young pea plants, as I mentioned before, can withstand a light frost and they will grow at temperatures above 40 degrees. So again, plant them early. Um, they like cooler temperatures between that 55 and 65. And once the temperature gets above 85 degrees, the, the peas, did, and probably many of you know that, have kind of poor quality. Um, there are other types of peas. Uh, the snow peas and sugar snap peas uh, they're thin and tender. They're eaten while there's still only tiny traces of peas inside. They're just a great pea to eat. Uh, these types of peas are usually associated with Asian cuisine, but uh, they are great peas to eat. Just uh, uh, in harvesting the, the shelling peas, uh, observe the plants carefully. These things can move fast on you. Uh, sampling the crop each day. Uh, once the pods begin to fill the peas, they can move real fast. And optimum pea harvest occurs when the peas are slightly larger than just what you planted, the seeds that you planted. They're sweet, tender, thin skin, and non-starchy at that time. But once the peas have reached their full maturity, they will quickly become inedible within one to three days. They just, uh, when your peas start turning kind of a silver gray color, the pods themselves 
are kind of over the, over the hill. How many have used one of these machines? Have you grown peas? I just put this picture in there. I found this when I was doing some research. Anybody have experience with this and how does it work? Anybody have? We grow a lot of peas at home, my wife and I. We freeze about 15 to 20 uh, pint packages every year. And it's an awful lot of work to shell them with peas by hand. So I just thought I'd throw this in there if anybody had, uh, had purchased one of these. And nobody's used it. OK. <laughs> Uh, they're about 40, 50 bucks, so I think I'm going to try it and see if it works. But uh, we love peas. Well, peas have a the most common problem is this powdery mildew, a foliar disease uh, that's common in hot weather. So again, growing them in the early spring, you can avoid some of that problem. Uh, they're covered in this whitish mold, and there are, you know, when you look on your seed packets, they see if you can find varieties that are. Um, that are resistant to um, the mold problem. But uh, now there are varieties that are leafless and semi-leafless, and they may be less prone to some of the diseases because of the improved air circulation throughout the plants, because they have less leaves or just more air circulation. Yes? Is there such a thing as a semi-leafless mountain? A semi-leafless? <coughs> I'm not sure. I'm saying that. Maybe like that, but we always think of the powdery mildew. Last year, we didn't Yes, sure. Also, we always fence them. Now, should we try to fix it? Because you can just pull a fence out, try to pull everything off, but you don't get everything off the fence. Mm -hmm. And if you have powder milk, you can the fence is all over each other. Is that still on that? If that fence disease will carry over? I don't think so, but I'm not certain. But I don't think it should carry over. Mm -hmm. But the best preventative is, you know, if you do grow peas, is to Follow directions and don't plant them too close together. The best preventative is good air circulation. And if you can grow them on a trellis too, that might help a little bit with some of the, with the uh, uh, mold problem. But sometimes, like you say, last June it got hot and whatever else right away. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, well, yes. So a lot of times on a fence, your feet on both sides. Yes, that true. Probably, that probably makes them too close. To that probably side. does, yep. There's just less air circulation if you have them on both sides, right? Grown thin, yeah, yeah. With a lot of these diseases, with any type of crop, and we're very fortunate in West Central Minnesota that we have tend to have a lot of wind. We have all these wind breaks that kind of block out some of this wind. But uh, you know, air circulation is the best preventative uh, for many of these problems that we might experience in our vegetable or fruit garden. Mm -hmm. Onions, direct sow onion seeds early in the season, just again by seed. Uh, after they emerge, thin in about the three to four inches. Uh, onions, as you probably know, also can be planted from sets. You can buy those anywhere. You can plant them as soon as possible in the spring. There's also transplants. Uh, a favorite variety of mine that's been around for a long time is, is called candy that you can buy as transplants in a lot of the garden centers. Uh, plant when the temperatures reach about 50 degrees. Don't plant them as early as the, the seeded or the, uh, the sets. Plant them about two inches deep and about three to four inches apart, and they'll fill up that whole area. That candy will grow four inches wide if you give it the right uh, conditions. Um, storage onions grown in Minnesota are called long day types, and they require about 14 or more hours of daylight to form the ball, so uh, a long period of time. Um, onions require a good supply of nitrogen. They love nitrogen to get those large uh, onions that's uh, in that picture. But too much nitrogen uh, results in late maturity, these large necks that are difficult to cure, and they just don't keep well for you. So if you are going to need some nitrogen, you know, side dress the fertilizer after the root systems are well developed, you do this once or twice during the growing season. And you can use standard urea, which is about 40 some percent nitrogen, at a rate of one pound per 25 uh, foot of row. Onions are very shallow rooted and uh, require constant moisture. Also, when you're hoeing weeds besides your onions, make sure you're not disturbing those roots with your hoe. Um, proper watering is very important for, for good production. And make sure you stop that watering when the bulbs have reached full size and the tops start to fall over like that. Harvesting onions. Harvest onions, when about half the tops are starting to fall over, you can lift them in the ground. You can leave them set there for several days if the water, if the weather is warm and dry. 
or else you can bring them indoors to cure and keep them warm, very warm, 75 to 90 degrees. You keep them in your garage uh, where it might get warm on a sunny day, but they need to be in a well-ventilated area for two to four weeks until those bald scales uh, start to dry and those necks are tight. Um, sometimes onions can be rather fussy. If you don't go through this whole process, they just don't keep that long in storage. But when you do store them, store them in a cool area, and, uh, and if you can find a mesh bag, a, a potato bag, or a, an onion bag, uh, works really nice by just hanging it up so it gets plenty of air circulation. You can use a bush, bushel basket or a flat cardboard box that has small holes punched in it so it gets that air circulation. But don't let them freeze. They're best not to really keep in the refrigerator if you're wanting to keep them the entire winter, uh, and they'll start to sprout and catch to about 40 degrees. We're still, uh, we grew onions, we grew the candy variety, and uh, they were like that size this last year, and uh, they're just perfect right now. And we've just kept them at, in, a wire, in, a, in a mesh bag and in the dry place, and they keep a long, long time. One thing that uh, uh, my coworker Bernie taught me to do is with the onions, so you have onions all season long, you never have to buy onions, is we, when they were fresh like that, uh, probably in about November or December, we started to cut them up and we put them in freezer bags. And we've got onions all summer long when we don't have onions uh, throughout the rest of the year.